In this video, I will be making Phenyl B E pin, which might be one of the most useful chemicals of this year. If you want to know a little more about it, make sure to watch part 1. As a small recap, Phenyl B E pin is a useful reagent to make CC bonds with another aryl halide compound. It is much easier to purify and usually has higher yields compared to the currently used B pin compounds. So, first, as a continuation of the previous video, I wanted to try a method that can separate the azeotrope of methanol and trimethyl borate to get pure trimethyl borate, which is needed for this synthesis. But unfortunately, what I needed did not arrive on time. But I heard it was possible to separate them by adding lithium chloride. Afterward, it can likely be further purified by distilling it through sodium metal and molecular sieves. Let me know down below if you still want to see that. Anyhow, I had to buy some instead. And with that, I can continue with the next step, which is making phenyl boronic acid. First, I will prepare a Grignard reagent by reacting bromobenzene with magnesium metal to form phenyl magnesium bromide. I can then use this Grignard reagent and react it with trimethyl borate to form phenyl boronic acid. Unfortunately, this one isn't as easy as normal Grignard reactions. In this case, the reaction will need to stay at or below minus 60 C, and neither reagent can be present in excess at the same time. Afterward, by addition of aqueous acid, it can be hydrolyzed to phenyl boronic acid. With some workup, it can then be purified, and after that, I can continue with making the phenyl B E pin. Luckily, this reaction is very simple, and these reactants can simply be mixed in a 1 to 1 ratio in DCM. The part that requires time here is the workup, since there will still be impurities from both the reactants, and perhaps some side products. And of course you don't want them in there for such a specialized reagent. So to purify it, I will do column chromatography for the first time on my channel. When the phenyl B E pin is further purified, we can do a Suzuki Miyaura coupling reaction with an aryl bromide like bromobenzene to test it out. For that reaction, I will use a general unoptimized procedure, so it will likely not be the best result, but still it is very likely to at least give some product. So to get started, I set up a heating mantle and a 1 liter 3 neck flask. Then I attach a condenser and a gas adapter with a nitrogen line. I drop in a stir bar and attach a funnel. And then add 23.7 grams of magnesium turnings. On top of that, I add in 40 ml of ether and then swap the funnel for a dropping funnel. To the dropping funnel, I add in 105 ml of bromobenzene and 160 ml of ether. Then I attach some clips and add in a bit of the bromobenzene solution. I heat the flask lightly to start the reaction, and we can see it starting because it is turning cloudy. It begins to reflux and then turns brown. I keep adding the bromobenzene solution so that the mixture keeps refluxing. After a while all of the bromobenzene solution has been added, and the mixture is a dark brown. I then leave it to stir for another 20 minutes under nitrogen. When that is done, I set up a flask with a septum next to it. Since I want to reuse the flask that the reaction was done in, and I also don't want to use all of my Grignard reagents right away, I want to transfer the Grignard reagent to another flask. To do that, I will do a cannula transfer, so that it doesn't come in contact with air and moisture. I add a needle to the flask on the right, with a large bore diameter, which will serve as the exit. Then I add a needle with a syringe, that is connected to a nitrogen bottle. I blow nitrogen into the flask for a few minutes, which will remove all of the air. When that is done, I remove the nitrogen inlet and outlet. I also disassemble the left flask and put in a stopper and a septum. Then I stop stirring the flask that contains the Grignard reagent to let all the remaining magnesium settle to the bottom. Then I bring a cannula into the flask, which is basically a very long needle with two pointy ends. I then bend the cannula and place it in both flasks, with the cannula being submerged on the left. To the flask on the right, I add a needle with a large bore diameter that will serve as an exit. Then to the flask on the left, through the septum, I add in the needle and syringe that is connected to the nitrogen bottle. I then open the nitrogen flow, which will increase the pressure and force the liquid through the cannula into the other flask. I then wait until most of the liquid has transferred to the other flask. After a while, pretty much all of the liquid has been transferred. So I stop the nitrogen flow and take out the needles and the cannula. Now I have transferred all of the Grignard reagent into another flask without it getting into contact with the air. So now that I have my Grignard reagent ready, I can move on with the next reaction. So to prepare for the next reaction, I set up a large dish with a bunch of dry ice. I then add in a bunch of acetone, which will cool it down to pretty much the same temperature as the dry ice, which is minus 78 C. The next reaction will have to be done at these extremely cold temperatures, otherwise it will not form the desired product. So I set up a flask with a stir bar, and then add 300 ml of diethyl ether. I add a gas adapter, start stirring, and then submerge the flask into the dry ice acetone bath. On the left neck, I added a small dropping funnel, 
and on the right a large dropping funnel. I attach a nitrogen line and flush the whole apparatus. When that is done, I remove it and I start adding the Grignard reagent that I prepared before. In total, I transfer about 100 ml of the phenyl magnesium bromide solution into the large dropping funnel. I reattach the nitrogen line and allowed constant nitrogen overpressure to be present in the setup with the exit on top of the left dropping funnel. Then to the left dropping funnel, I add in 60 ml of trimethyl boride, which is likely an excess compared to the Grignard reagent. I then slowly add in both reagents into the flask so that neither are present in excess inside of the flask. I allow it to drip at a steady but slow rate so that the temperature doesn't increase too much because it has to stay below minus 60 C. The mixture quickly becomes cloudy and off-white in color. I keep supplying dry ice to keep the temperature low and allow it all to react. When all of the reagents have been added, I continue to let it stir for 20 more minutes. When that is done, I take it out, I remove the dropping funnels and the gas adapter. I attach a thermometer adapter to make sure that the temperature does not increase past 0 C. Now the next step is to destroy any remaining reagents by adding in water, which will also hydrolyze some of the intermediate and form the desired phenylboronic acid. I slowly add in 35 ml of water and the mixture becomes a slurry. After a few minutes, we can see the ether layer separate from the water layer. Now to hydrolyze all of the intermediate to phenylboronic acid, I add in a total of 17 ml of concentrated sulfuric acid in 200 ml of water. I slowly add it so that the temperature doesn't increase too fast. When the temperature becomes too high, I temporarily place the flask back into the dry ice acetone bath. I kept adding the dilute sulfuric acid and after a while all of it had been added, so I took it out of the dry ice acetone bath. Now I let it warm up a little and then transfer all of it to a separatory funnel to separate the ether and the water layer. I set the ether layer aside and pour the water layer back into the separatory funnel and extract it with some ether. I shake it around and then drain away the water layer, though it seems some undissolved solid is remaining, so I add in some extra water to take it out. I shook it around again and it cleared up nicely. Now I separate the layers again and combine the ether layers. I then extracted the water layer once more with ether. Now I transfer the combined ether extracts into a flask and set it up for distillation. I first distill over half of the ether and then through the left dropping funnel, I add in a total of 250 ml of water during the distillation, which will steam distill off a lot of impurities. I increase the temperature to boil off all of the ether and then start boiling over water. When the temperature in the hat started reading exactly 100 C, the steam distillable impurities should have been carried away. So now I can stop the distillation. Now to precipitate out the phenylboronic acid, I have to cool it down. So while stirring, I set it back into the acetone bath and start adding dry ice to cool it down. I added more acetone and we can see the mixture becoming more and more cloudy. After a short while, the whole mixture turns white and so much product precipitates out that it has become a solid and cannot be stirred. I leave it to cool down for a little while longer and then start a vacuum filtration. So through the filter, I pour in all of the mixture, but it is quite difficult since it's mostly a solid. So I wash it inside the flask with some 40-65 petroleum ether to try to break it up and wash away some impurities. When it still didn't want to break apart, I abused the flask and poured all of the solid onto the filter and washed it once more with petroleum ether. When all of it had collected on the filter, I leave it to run for a few minutes. I then put it all into a dish. What I have here should be the phenylboronic acid, but it's extremely wet and it seems to hold on to a huge amount of water. So I set the dish onto a heating plate to try to dry it. I have to be careful with the drying step to not remove too much water, since the boric acid will dehydrate and form boroxines while releasing water. We can see this equilibrium reaction take place. Besides it having increased solubility in the hot water that was remaining, it is also dehydrating into triphenyl boroxine and releasing water. So it becomes a liquid with a lot of chunks, which keeps forming a solid layer on top. When the heat is taken away, it will form back into phenylboronic acid, but if too much water is evaporated away, it will stay in its boroxine form, unless it is rehydrated. Since I know that there is too much water, I can slowly evaporate away some of the water and see if the powder will still be wet afterwards. I take it off heat and it solidifies again, but it's still pretty wet, so I'm going to do a more controlled method of taking out the water. So I put everything into a flask and heat it while putting a vacuum on it. Quickly water starts coming out of the powder, so I leave it running for a while. When it looks done, I mix it around a bit to see if it is still wet, but it looks like it's mostly dry. I put everything into a dish again, and we can see that the volume has decreased quite a lot. I crush the remaining chunks a bit to get it all into a powder, 
and the final yield of phenylboronic acid is 75 to 87 percent. Since I don't know the exact concentration of the phenyl magnesium bromide that was used, I can only do an estimation. Anyhow, the yield is pretty decent, so now I can continue with the next step, which is making phenyl B E pin. So I set up a flask and add in all of the phenylboronic acid that I made. I then set up a beaker and weighed out 35 grams of E pin, which is one equivalent. Then to this, I add in 350 mL of DCM. We can see the E pin dissolves easily into the DCM and it pretty much disappears instantly. Now to the flask with the phenylboronic acid, I add in a stir bar and then to this flask, I add in all of the E pin solution and start stirring. I stopper the flask lightly and then leave it to stir for a day. Compared to the procedure I'm following, I am doing it more concentrated because I didn't want to use extreme amounts of solvent and I don't have a flask larger than one liter. In the procedure they use 0.1 molar as concentration, which would mean I need two liters of DCM. Also, they use a nitrogen atmosphere for the flask and dried DCM, but I didn't do that. Anyhow, when I come back the next day, the mixture has turned a clear yellow. All the solids are gone and we can see some water has formed during the reaction. Now I quickly boil off some of the solvent to reduce its volume, so I can work with it more properly. Now I add some water to quench the reaction and wash it a little, and I move it to a separatory funnel. I wash the flask once with some DCM, and shake it a bit so that the fresh DCM mixes with the DCM layer properly. After that, I separate the bottom DCM layer from the top water layer. I keep the water layer in the sub funnel, and then add some fresh DCM to extract it. I separate it again, and we can see some stringy impurity inside the water layer, which will be left behind. I then combined the DCM layer and the extracts in a beaker, and added some sodium sulfate to dry it. I stirred around a bit, and then let it sit for a while. After that, I filter it all through some cotton and sea light, directly into a flask. When that is done, I set the solution up for a vacuum distillation to boil off all of the DCM. When all the DCM is gone, it stops boiling and some yellow oil is left in the flask. So now we have the raw phenyl B E pin, but it is obviously not pure, since it should be pretty much colorless. Since the components are very unlikely to be properly separated by many purification techniques, I will have to resort to column chromatography. To confirm the impurities and see how they behave, and to select an element for column chromatography, I ran multiple quick TLCs. The first one with 5% ethyl acetate and hexanes. And we can see that there are at least 3 UV active spots. I then stain the plate with a potassium permanganate solution and heat the plate with a heat gun to develop the spots. On the plate, we can see at least 5 or 6 compounds are present. On the bottom we have phenylboronic acid, which doesn't move on the TLC plate. Then above that we can see 2 small spots that are likely some impurities. Since phenylboronic acid is not stable in silica gel, it degrades and likely creates multiple different spots. The next spot we are seeing is E pin, which is very faint. The spot after that should be the phenyl B E pin, which is also the largest compound present. After that, a faint spot can be seen, which is likely a degradation product from phenylboronic acid. I also tested pure commercial phenylboronic acid, which shows both the first and the last spot on the TLC. Now since the EPIN and the phenyl B EPIN are so close together, I will not use this eluent for the column. I wanted to have a bit more space between the spots, so I will test some other mixtures to see which one is best. The next one I tested was 2% ethyl acetate in hexanes, but the separation was a lot worse and it didn't travel far enough, so I won't use this one either. The next one I tested was 20% DCM and 80% hexanes, where we can see the separation is a lot better and they also travel a good distance up the plate, so I will use this as my eluent for the column. After letting the phenyl B E pin sit for a day, some crystals had settled out. Since the phenyl B E pin is a liquid, this must be one of the reactants or an impurity, so it is actually fine that this happened, since I can remove it easily. I set it in the freezer for a bit, so everything will settle out, and then I filter it all with vacuum filtration through a glass fitted filter. I then collect some of the residue and test it with TLC to see what it is. At first I thought it was e -pin, but the TLC tells us that it is mostly phenylboronic acid. On the left is the residue that I collected, and on the right the pure e -pin that I made. We see that the spot that corresponds with e -pin is actually very small on the left. Since the solid wasn't dry and trapped some of the liquid, we of course also expect to see all of the other compounds of that liquid in the TLC. The thing is that the phenylboronic acid has a huge spot on the left, which is not the case when normally testing the liquid. This tells us that the solid is mostly phenylboronic acid that crystallized out. We also see a very large spot at the top, which is the degradation product of phenylboronic acid again. Now that I have a better idea of the components of my mixture, I can start separating them. So I set up a column, 
and add in 180 grams of silica gel 60 in 20% DCM and 80% hexanes. Since I have a large amount of product, about 50 grams, I would have to use an insanely large amount of silica gel to separate them properly. Normally the ratio of silica gel to product would be 1 to 20 at lowest, but this would require an insane 1 kilogram of silica gel to get a proper separation, and probably wouldn't even fit in the column. Now it would be a little excessive to go for a high purity final product, since that is not really necessary for what I will be doing, but at the same time, it is also a little wasteful to not process all of my product, so in this case, I will do a ratio of about 1 to 3 to 4, which will mean that there will be more overlap between the compounds when they come off the column. But some fractions that contain phenyl B E pin will have a much higher purity than the others, since at some point it will be only phenyl B E pin that comes off the column. So to get the highest purity final product as possible with this ratio, I will collect many fractions and in the end see which fraction contains the most and the purest phenyl B E pin. So when the column is fully packed and the solvent level reaches the top of the silica gel, I add in all of my product on top. Normally you have to do it slowly and carefully to not disturb the silica and keep it leveled. But I messed up a little, so there's a little dent, but it won't matter too much for this separation. So when all of it is on top, I open the flow again and wait until all of the product has lowered into the silica gel. When that happens, I can safely add more aluant on top without messing up the separation. Now I simply allow the column to run and add more aluant when necessary. After about a day of running, I collected 32 fractions there are approximately 40 to 50 mil each, and 5 larger fractions at the end. The interesting thing is that some fractions respond to 380 nanometers UV light, which might indicate something, but we have to check it with TLC. When I shine them with a the UV light, they start glowing blue, but this doesn't happen to many of the other fractions. So I TLC it an assortment of fractions, and we can see that fraction 12 mostly has phenyl B E pin. Fraction 12 is also one of the fractions that was active with the UV light, which was only seen in fractions 10 to 15. So perhaps the large concentration of phenyl B E pin is responsible for this. We can also see that pretty much all of the phenyl boronic acid is gone, since it was always stuck at the beginning of the plate, and thus is also stuck in the beginning of the column, which makes for an easy separation. I ran some more TLCs, which I don't have good pictures of, but I decided to take fractions 10 to 15 combine them and boil off the solvent, since it seems they had the largest amount of phenyl B E pin and were the most pure. So I set it up for a short path vacuum distillation and distill over all of the DCM and hexanes. When it stops boiling, all of the solvent is gone and I was left with an almost colorless and clear oil. I put it into a graduated cylinder and it seems we have about 24 mils of phenyl B E pin. There's still a little bit of impurity in there because it is not completely colorless. But from itself, it reacts lightly to 380 nanometer UV light and produces a blue light. So it seems that it is indeed stable on silica gel and can be purified like the authors mentioned. So now the next step is to do a reaction with it and see if it works. So I set up a 3 neck flask and add in a stir bar. I then attach a gas adapter with a nitrogen line, a condenser and a funnel. Through the funnel, I then add in a total of 318 ml of toluene. Then to the toluene, I add in 8.8 .8 grams of potassium carbonate. On top of that, I add in 32 mils of water. I remove the funnel and add in 3.33 mils of bromobenzene. Then I add in 12.43 grams of phenyl B E pin. I reattach the funnel and add in 334 milligrams of triphenylphosphine. I remove the funnel again and then carefully add in 72 milligrams of palladium acetate. We can see that the mixture slowly becomes yellow. This is because the palladium acetate and triphenylphosphine are producing the catalyst for this reaction, which is tetrakis triphenylphosphine palladium zero, which has a yellow color. Now that everything has been added, I heat the mixture so that it begins to boil and then leave it to reflux for 24 hours. When I come back, the color has disappeared and some black powder remains. This is because the catalyst degrades over time and forms palladium black. I take it off heat and then let it cool down and when it has cooled down, I set up a separatory funnel and pour in all of the mixture. I wash the flask with some fresh toluene and then drain away the bottom water layer. I then add in a bunch of extra water to wash out any remaining water soluble compounds and drain away the water layer again. Now the toluene layer has become cloudy because I added a bunch of fresh water which slightly dissolves into the toluene. So to pull out most of the water from the toluene layer, I wash it with a saturated sodium chloride solution. Now the toluene has become clear again so I separate the layers and collect the toluene layer, and I then dry the toluene layer by adding anhydrous sodium sulfate. I mix it around and then let it sit for a while. Now I filter it all through some cotton and sea light 
and collect the filtrate directly in a flask. Now I set the filtrate up for a short path distillation to boil off all of the toluene. After it has all been boiled off, some orange junk remains. Now I want to get rid of this orange impurity, so I add in some water and then some ether. This will take up any biphenyl that is present. I then stir it for a bit and move it all to a separatory funnel. I separate the layers and then filter the ether layer through some cotton and sea light to get out all of the orange stuff. I then start boiling off all of the ether. I also took some TLCs of the ether extract to see what is in there. As expected, there is still phenyl B epium present, but we also see a big spot at the top, which should be biphenyl. I also tested the ether extract with only 0.5% ethyl acetate, and I actually like this separation more. Since these compounds can't really be separated properly in any other way, I will have to do another column. After all the ether has been boiled off, a yellow liquid remains. So I set up a column with 200 grams of spherical silica gel 60 and use 0.5% ethyl acetate in hexanes as my eluent. Like before, when the liquid level reaches the top of the silica, I slowly add in all of the product. Now I run the column a bit more so that all of the product is pulled into the silica gel and then add more of the eluent on top. At first, I collected more than 400 ml of eluent that didn't contain anything, so I reused it. Then when something started coming through, I set up test tubes to contain fractions of about 40 to 50 ml each. After collecting about 10 fractions, we can see on the TLC that biphenyl is present up to fraction 8 and disappears at fraction 9. So I combine fraction 1 to 8 and set it up for a short path vacuum distillation to boil off all of the solvent. After pretty much all of the solvent had been boiled off, I am left with a white solid at the bottom. I scraped off some of it and dissolved the remaining bit in ether and poured it into a crystallizing dish and started boiling off all of the ether. When all of the ether is gone, the solid crystallizes out, which I scraped off and combined with the stuff from before. I put it all into a weighing boat and the yield turned out to be 260 milligrams which is 5.3%. Now this yield is pretty sad, but the cause of this is that I am not using an optimized method. If you were doing research to make a specific product, you would test out many different conditions and do the reaction at a very small scale to see which one has the best conversion. Since I'm not really looking to find an optimized method for the production of this useless product, I'm not going to do that. So despite not having an optimized method, it still managed to produce some product, which I'm fine with. In many cases, it could also result in a yield of 0%. But maybe the BE Pins Power has managed to salvage some yield for me. So that was it for this video. I hope you enjoyed me making the most expensive biphenyl ever. If you'd like to reduce my financial suffering of this project, consider supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and as always, a special thanks to all my patrons. See ya!